Welcome to Zebrek Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud Watts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. The top stories this hour. Treasury yields hitting fresh highs for the year as the Fed chief signals further delays in cutting interest rates. The dollar on its best five-day run in 18 months. Jay Powell shifting his message after a series of surprisingly high inflation readings, saying rates can be held as long as needed. More recent data show solid growth and continued strength in the labor market, but also a lack of further progress so far this year on returning to our 2% inflation goal. And a rare sweep for the biggest U.S. banks, with five of them beating estimates on first quarter trading income. We'll take a look at the setup on really those remarks from Fed Chair Jay Powell signaling that rate cut delay may be the status quo now after what we have seen as a steady streak of inflation surprises. The Fed Chair saying appropriate, uh, it would be appropriate, I should say, to give policy further time to work, that they can stay higher for longer, essentially, for as long as needed, really pointing to the lack of additional progress made on curbing price pressures. And that is setting us up for uh, quite a mixed open here in Asia, Sydney Futures down by about three-tenths of one percent. Those hawkish comments really playing through when it comes to risk appetite. And we see that with muted trading in Kiwi stocks already. Chicago Nikkei futures, on the other hand, uh, looking like we'll see a bit of a pop. That steady run that we see when it comes to the strength in the U.S. dollar continuing to put pressure on dollar yen. Uh, we're not far from that 155 level now. That's going to benefit, of course, some of the trade and exporter-related names. But watch out, of course, for some more verbal intervention. Uh, Bell, given how concerned and the level of concern that we've seen from the finance ministry, um, the currency uh, diplomat in Japan really out every morning and these levels would be quite concerning too. Yeah, absolutely. But even at those levels as well, he's just saying how often he's reiterating the same comments. Japanese government officials prepared to act as needed. Uh, what we are tracking, though, we've got futures coming online this morning for U.S. stocks. And so far, we're looking fairly steady in this point in the trading day. Of course, uh, overnight, it was that story of equities weakness coming through. And as you said, it was that story of Jay Powell. Uh, we've often spoke about the so-called last mile of disinflation, whether it's going to take longer, that final stretch to get price pressures down to that target for the Fed. Uh, not enough progress has been made, and that was really reflected again through bond yields, of course, and we saw them hitting year-to-date highs, fresh year-to-date highs, Treasury yields across the curve. Uh, well, as we said, the focus on Powell is speaking in a panel discussion alongside the Bank of Canada governor in Washington. Here is what he is saying about how much more patience is needed. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2 percent before it would be appropriate to ease policy. You know, we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings that we had in the second half of last year. For more, let's bring in Sylvia Jablonski, CEO and CIO at Defiance ETFs. And Sylvia, perhaps a little bit of change of tune in the, in the messaging from Pal here, but does it come as any sort of surprise to you? Hi. Uh, well, you know, it doesn't come as much of a surprise to me, and I don't think his message is actually super different. I think the numbers just came in unexpectedly hotter than, you know, the market had anticipated. So jobs were a little bit stronger. Factory orders were a little bit stronger. We know CPI was a little bit stronger. Um, their favorite measure, PCE, was okay. Um, so, you know, we, we sort of have to see how this turns out in the next couple of months. I think that the Fed is going to be data dependent, as he and, and they've said all along. So, you know, we need to see the loosening of, of some of those um, inflation numbers in order for us to get those cuts that we want before the end of the year. I do think, though, that what will be surprising to the market is if they don't actually happen at all. I think everyone's kind of OK with two cuts, but zero might might be a little bit rockier. Yeah, that's actually uh, it takes us to our question of the day here. Are we going to reach a point this year where we actually do start to see markets uh, pricing in less than one cut? Because you think about where we were coming into the beginning of the year, it was around seven. Uh, now it's that really that radical readjustment. So are we are we at that point at this at this time. I don't think we're at that point at this time. You know, there is some evidence that, you know, different different prices are coming down. There is some evidence that wage inflation is starting to come down, um, housing starting to loosen up. You know, it's just not 
all going as quickly as we anticipate it to go. And you did have some seasonality that's starting to shake off now. So I think going forward, we'll we'll probably start to see numbers going in the right direction. You know, I don't think it's a situation where all bets are, are off the table. And there are other factors that are unknown that could have impact the markets and the economy as well. You know, all these geopolitical issues, for example, what happens with that and government spending? And, you know, how does that kind of impact the whole financial picture? So I, or financial policy picture. So I do think that it's still possible that we'll see a couple of rate cuts this year. I, I just don't see them really happening as soon as we wanted them to. We are seeing emerging market currencies uh, on the back of dollar strength at these year lows. And of course, we don't really need to uh, kind of extend too much conversation about the weakness that we continue to see in the yen, right? At what point does this start creating issues for these economies, particularly when you look at, you know, the big themes around financial stability? We've seen this play out in the past before. Is this time different? Yeah, I, I think, you know, what's different now is that there is this, you know, level of hyper alertness by by local governments, particularly Japan, for example, to focus on intervening if the currency issues, you know, continue, right? So it's sort of good, good for exporters and, and price, you know, poor price inflation for importers. But I think, you know, overall that a lot of the emerging market economies are quite concerned about this and, and you know, kind of aren't sure. I've been reading some um, feedback from, you know, the, the uh, president of Japan and saying that, you know, we, we sort of don't know yet, right? We have a little bit of data, but we don't have enough data and we're ready to intervene. So I do think that you're going to have, you know, infrastructure um, intervention there in terms of currencies on emerging markets. It kind of can't go on forever, so... Uh, what about increasing optimism? Are you seeing it when it comes to China? Yeah, so I think, you know, the the last reading that 5.3% was better than expected, and, you know, the 5% outlook for the year, I think, is going to be tough to manage. So the issues that we see in China are, you know, around property, which is kind of falling apart, and that's 30% of GDP there. And, you know, there's kind of a lack of business confidence and consumer confidence and, um, you know, kind of all, uh, domestic travel and international travel into China. So there are these areas that, you know, kind of need to pick up in order for GDP to sustain. But on the other side, you know, similar to, to Japan, you do have the, um, you do have, you know, Chinese government officials stepping in to, you know, back whether it's, you know, kind of bank loans, property loans, inject um, funds into the infrastructure infrastructure of the country. And then I, I think long term, you know, it's still the world's second largest economy, one of the biggest areas for the AI and machine learning boom. And so it's just going to take a little bit of time to kind of, you know, shake out the, the near term pain that, that the Chinese economy is facing. Sylvia, really great to have you with you, uh, with us as always. Sylvia Jablonski there joining us. And of course, the other aspect that we're watching is uh, bank earnings, right? And we do have some at least good news on that front. Bank of America shares, though, uh, falling the most in a year when it reported elevated expenses and charge-offs for bad loans, despite, of course, joining four other big U.S. lenders by beating expectations for trading venue revenue. On that side, it was a rare sweep. Let's bring our finance editor, Adam Hay, who uh, joins us now. So, so, Adam, the trading businesses, including equities, fixed income, back in focus. Why are we seeing such outperformance for these units? I think in many ways, Heidi, really, it's just a manifestation of, of what you've been seeing in markets now for, for a number of months. You know, increased activity on the equity side. You saw those Bank of America numbers. Their equities business is clearly benefiting from that. But, of course, the bond market as well has been so active, hasn't it? Not just in treasuries, but in developed market bonds around the world. Um, and that's really filtering through to quite a lot of the revenue lines in, in, in these banks. And Morgan Stanley, um, you know, coming in at about two and a half billion in revenue uh, on that front. And, and the Goldman numbers, uh, you know, topping expectations really in terms of what their trading investors are doing. Um, JP Morgan as well, fixed income and equity. So really just this huge amount of increase in activity uh, is is offering those equities and fixed income businesses that 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 and the buoyancy that they've needed to offset uh, what's happening on the lending side, of course, softer lending, uh, softness around the net interest income that banks are earning from that lending. And of course, you know, ongoing fragility about how to forecast what's happening in the US economy in the coming months means that at least those trading businesses are offering a little bright spot. And Adam, of course, the, the key theme over this week has really been this changing expectation again around what we're going to see for rate cuts. But how are bank bosses feeling about the outlook from the Fed and other central banks? 
Yeah, well, well, in a way, you know, they've been positioning for this for some time, haven't they? We've been hearing from quite a lot of the CEOs of the big banks about going into the back end of last year, how they were positioning for, you know, a changing state of the US economy. If that was going to be a situation where rates were being cut aggressively, they were prepared for that. They've done a lot on the cost-cutting front and the structural strategic readjustments that they need heading into an, an economy that's slowing. But of course, as we know, with markets having repriced uh, for, for a more benign environment, or certainly a sense that uh, the Fed isn't um, in a hurry to, to cut, it kind of puts the banks in, in still a, a, you know, a reasonably strong position vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in the rest of the, the market. So there's still a lot of people who want to own these uh, kind of companies at this point in the cycle. Yes, you might continue to see a bit of, of softness in uh, in, in that lending side of these businesses. But, you know, if markets stay active as they are and you get a bit of an uptick in the investment banking side of some of these banks with deals and M&A activity just showing signs of, you know, picking up somewhat from very subdued levels, uh, then you might be in a situation where these CEOs are, are, are positioning reasonably well. You're, you're still going to get these, you know, individual moves on the day, as we saw with, with Bank of America, a bit of softness there. I think structurally, if you look through the rest of this year now, um, most of these banks are, are pretty well placed um, to weather um, most of the uh, outcomes that the economy can throw at them. And certainly at the moment, if you believe market pricing at least and what the CEOs are telling us, the chances are that rates stay reasonably stable and we don't go into a period of aggressive cutting. One of those CEOs we heard from was, of course, David Solomon, and it was, you know, a, a back to basics kind of uh, print that worked out for Goldman. But is there kind of the shared view along with him that the optimism is back when it comes to investment banking, that we're kind of well and truly come off these depressed levels? No, I think the jury is still out. And, you know, Solomon does have a, a, a history, as do many of these bankers of, of wanting to, to somewhat talk up their, their their own book, and that's understandable. He he is right to the extent that there has been, um, you know, an uptick in in some areas, but I think it's too early to draw any kind of conclusion on the way that you see the the market, especially for for M and A, but but also in in things like secondary issuance for for equity and debt at the moment. Um, so a little bit too early to tell, but but clearly he's on the right track of, of the early signs there. And I think um, you're kind of, you, you know, you're seeing a little bit more of that commentary from, from other areas of the market. So just keep an eye on that really over the next couple of months to see whether that deal activity level uh, does hold up or, or show even signs of building from here. With Merck Finance Senator Adam Haig there. And we do have an exclusive interview with JP Morgan Chase, CEO Jamie Diamond, and the second season premiere of The Circuit with Emily Chang. You can see it here on Bloomberg Television. That's 6 p.m. Wednesday, New York time, 6 a.m. Thursday, if you're watching out of Hong Kong. Still ahead on Daybreak Australia, new Stanford research tracking a massive surge in funding for generative AI, topping $25 billion last year. We get more from that report later in the hour. But first, Janet Yellen warning of stronger U.S. sanctions on Iran within days. We get the latest on the developments in the Middle East next. This is Bloomberg. India's elections kick off with a focus on the economy, social divisions, and climate change actions that will influence the global story. Bloomberg is live on location with the latest updates from the world's largest democracy. Coverage begins April 19th. I fully expect that we will take additional sanctions action against Iran in the coming days. Um, we don't preview our sanctions tools, but in discussions I've had, um, all options to disrupt terrorist financing uh, of Iran continue to be on the table. 
Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on the U.S. response to Iran's recent attack on Israel. And the White House is now saying in a statement that fresh sanctions will target Iran's missile and drone program and entities supporting the Revolutionary Guard and the Defense Ministry. For more analysis, let's bring in Kirsten Fontenrose, who's a president at Red Six International. She's previously worked with the Departments of Defense and State and as Senior Director for Gulf Affairs at the U.S. National Security Council. Kirsten, great to have you with us. And we were just chatting uh, in the commercial break before you're saying that the likelihood of a further retaliation is is 100 percent and it's just a matter of uh, what when and, and i suppose what this looks like and if we hear about it exactly i think the israeli government has announced that they will retaliate it's just a matter of when they're holding their own discretion about when and where we saw the prime minister address the opposition yesterday. There was a heated debate that usually precedes a big action on the part of the Israeli government. So even before they made the announcement, we were pretty sure this was coming. They have several options for retaliation. The Biden administration has urged them to wait, to plan, to respond with a cool head, maybe at a time when a response is not expected, so it would be even more successful. And But they have some options even when they do choose about how big it is or how obvious, as you mentioned, how overt it is. They can act asymmetrically, which both Iran and Israel are fairly good at doing, which means the entire globe is their board game for action. Uh, and it would keep Iran on its toes. It would require a lot of uh, vigilance on Iran's part, which would keep them resource, you know, uh, poor, even more than they are, and, uh, and would require a lot of intelligence gathering. So even the threat of some sort of asymmetric retaliation anywhere in the world can make the, the government that's expecting this kind of attack uh, really preoccupied at a time when Israel would probably like to see Iran preoccupied. Um, Israel could also undertake conventional airstrikes, perhaps on the drone or missile production facilities or the storage warehouses, some of which are in the east of Iran, which would mean that if you're Israel and you're conducting a conventional airstrike, you'd only have to spend a small amount of time in Iran's airspace, which could be critical for conducting a successful activity. Uh, you could also use cyber. You could use covert operations inside Iran. This could be on defense production facilities. It could be on communications networks. It could be on the operation systems that run military bases. It could be on nuclear sites. So there are lots of options for covert and cyber. The good thing about these is generally it does not panic investors. It does not panic publics. It generally does not threaten uh, civilians in, in any way. It's usually meant to send a signal about we can reach you. We, the attacker, can reach you if we want to uh, without causing civilian casualties or the like. The one risk I think Israel must be weighing right now about the retaliation choice is the risk that Iran uses the retaliation as a pretext for weaponizing its so its nuclear program. It's looking for excuses potentially to do this, and it could claim that a greater threat requires a greater deterrent. So they'll probably be having a lot of conversations in Tel Aviv with both the U.S. and European partners about whether or not this risk is one worth taking. That would put us into a nuclear escalation cycle that would be potentially even more dangerous. Uh, how close are we to that mobilization in terms of Iran's nuclear capacity? We're quite close. Iran, what it's chosen to do is to keep its nuclear program just below the weaponization level. So prior to, to you know, current times, we talked about Iran building one nuclear bomb. Right now what they've done is they've taken their material, their materiel, their enrichment, up to a level where they are not passing into weaponization, but instead of building one, they will have enough fissile material to build two or three or maybe four later, later down the line. So they're staying just short of that level that would kick into action a lot of perhaps unleashing of cyber or covert operations against their nuclear facilities, perhaps conventional action against their nuclear facilities, international censure, actions by the UN. You know, when you weaponize, you invite a whole lot of negative attention. So if you stay just under that level, as Iran has chosen to do, should you decide to weaponize, you now have the material to do quite a bit more damage than you did previously but you're just keeping right under that radar. So you have some leverage at negotiating mm. tables, but you are not attracting that kind of uh, punishing attention.
The other argument, of course, would be that Israel should focus on its operations in Gaza, right, including in Rafa, where we're hearing that around 8,000 fighters are already stationed. Uh, obviously, a victory against Hamas would be a victory against Iran. Do you think that that is maybe a, a, a better medium-term or longer-term view? Well, a lot of the, the government hallway talk in Israel is about whether or not it's worth fighting this victory against one tool or whether or not it's worth going for a victory at the root of the problem. So this is a really hot topic. Uh, do we bother taking out these proxies one at a time or do we go for the for the head of Medusa? Should we actually teach Iran that this proxy foreign strategy is one that uh, we won't tolerate? Um, and in some cases, some of the Arab states are a little concerned that Israel is using this new escalation with Iran as a way to distract the world from what's going on in Gaza, perhaps to give them more time to conduct operations preparing for Rafah without the world paying such close attention. But if you're Israel, you have to you have to weigh your priorities. You have Iran, you have Hamas, you have Hezbollah, you have the Houthis. You can't take them all on at once. And the U.S. has said it won't support retaliation against Iran. So you just say, OK. We'll do something small scale there and we'll focus on finishing off Hamas. Or do you say we're going to just go to where the origins lie and take care of the problem there, send a deterrent message to Iran, not a destruction message, a deterrent message to Iran, pull back on this on this game you're playing or you will personally mm. pay the price inside your own country. We will no longer allow you to fight to the last Palestinian. Kirsten, Part of this this response to Iran's attack has been a sort of renewed warmth, you could say, between relations of, of the U.S. key allies and Israel that have been hardened uh, given Israel's actions in Gaza. How long do you see this new dynamic or that shift persisting? I think it will depend on what kind of retaliation they choose. Right now, a lot of these governments are walking a thin line. They really do feel like their decision to side with sort of the U.S., the U.K., the Western Bloc, be part of the CENTCOM umbrella in the region, countering Iran's malign influence in the region, countering its proxies, pushing back against its, its missile and drone programs and smuggling, they feel like this has paid off. We, the U.S. has proven that this umbrella of partner nations really does come to a country's defense, and it really works. It's 99 percent successful. It defeating a barrage of missiles and drones. But they're also getting criticism from their, their streets for protecting Israel at a time when a lot of these publics feel like Israel is being heavy-handed in Gaza. So they're having to walk this tightrope. And I think the kind of retaliation Israel carries out will help define how close these Arab governments can be perceived as aligning themselves with Israeli goals for their populations. You saw the Jordanian foreign minister come out and say after their country used F-16s, we believe, to help take down a lot of these munitions, he came out and said, but we really don't want to see this be a distraction from Gaza. He's, he's trying to prove we're a part of defense. We would also knock these out of the air if they came from Israeli airspace going anywhere else. This is about Jordanian territorial sovereignty. Many of the countries are saying that, Saudi Arabia, the UAE. Mm -hmm. Of course we're going to knock things out of the sky when they come into our airspace because about half of these things fail and they fall on the heads of our citizens. So that is the reason they're giving. They're not saying this is about a unified defense of Israel. They're not claiming mm -hmm. this is about being aligned with U.S. CENTCOM. They're saying it's about their sovereignty. Yeah. All right, Kirsten, thanks so much for your time. That was Kirsten Fontenrose there, president at Red Six International. We'll have more ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Well, stocks in Asia looking pretty mixed ahead of the open. Hawkish comments from Jay Powell feeding in. You've got a stronger dollar, higher treasury yields. That's all part of the tra trading dynamic for today.
take a look at some of the Kiwi assets that we're watching and quite a bit of fluctuation when it comes to the New Zealand dollar. But the trajectory is quite clear, particularly given uh, the upside that we continue to see in the US dollar. Dollar Kiwi, though, trading 58.93 at the moment. There is expected to be uh, really broader downward pressure going forward. We had CPI data that slowed to the weakest in just about three years for the first quarter. Even as we see domestic price pressures persisting, we saw annual inflation easing to 4% from 4.7% in the fourth quarter, uh, and that is the lowest reading since the second quarter of 2021, in line with expectations. So, uh, taming inflation by cutting government spending will be a key part of New Zealand Prime Minister Christopher Luxon's upcoming budget. He discussed his spending priorities with us in Singapore, where he's leading a trade delegation to Southeast Asia. I think New Zealand has fantastic potential. You know, I personally think it's the best country on earth, and you'd expect me to say that. But I it actually, is beautiful. I, I, it is without <laughs> doubt. It is without doubt. And I think we have a fantastic future ahead of us. Uh, we have two things that we've got to do. One is in terms of rebuilding the economy. It's making sure we get the cost of living crisis uh, under control for people. Uh, what you've seen is a huge amount of government spending that's driven domestic inflation, lifted interest rates, slowed the economy up, and obviously puts pressure on unemployment. And so we're working incredibly hard to bring inflation down. We've made some good progress already in the 150 or so days that I've been in power. Uh, you've actually seen you know, there's no further rise in interest rates. We've seen inflation trending down. Uh, we hope to have it back within our band by the end of the year as well. And that will make a huge difference for New Zealanders who are struggling with the cost of living crisis. You know, um, you know, inflation under control, interest rates coming down, the economy growing and obviously people secure in employment. And then the really exciting work is actually how do we, how do we really turbocharge growth in New Zealand. And that for us is making sure that we invest in a world class education system, embrace the science technology, uh, certainly make sure we build out modern reliable infrastructure, get rid of red tape and, and, and have smart regulation, but uh, get rid of red tape and green tape, uh, and importantly have international connections to the world both in a trade and an investment sense. And that's why I'm here in Southeast Asia this week, is just to underscore uh, how important um, the, you know, Southeast Asia is to New Zealand going forward. Can inflation continue to decline and ease uh, given what's happening in the US? You know, inflation remaining elevated and sticky. Yeah, look, I think you know, in New Zealand, you know, we're very focused as a government. We have our budget coming up at the end of May. Uh, that is a chance for us to make sure that we are generating, you know, good financial discipline and and and, and a good culture of financial discipline. Uh, we won't uh, repair everything that happened in the previous six years of one year's budget, but we are very determined to have a very consistent approach to managing our finances and getting our fiscal books in order. And so uh, we've got a major exercise on with respect to our government spending, making sure we're getting rid of the wasteful spending. We think that is the way uh, to support um, certainly uh, lowering inflation, domestic inflation, which then brings those interest rates down and gets the economic growth happening mm. as well. We also think it's important that we're able to offer tax relief to lower middle income New Zealanders as well after 14 years of not, uh, not having any tax relief and we think that's an important thing as well. You talked about wanting to boost growth, yet you're also considering, your government is considering uh, cutting spending at the upcoming uh, budget. Uh, how does that help to revive growth? How does that help the economy? Well, look, we've had an 84% increase in government spending in the previous six years. Uh, and what we've acknowledged and what we've identified is that actually there's a lot of inefficient and wasteful government spending. What we want to do is prioritise and protect our frontline public services. But we actually expect every taxpayer dollar to make sure it generates a return on that investment and it actually delivers for the New Zealand people. And so what we've identified is uh, inefficiencies and savings and wasteful programmes uh, and making sure that we actually direct that, that, that money into repairing our books, but also importantly protecting our frontline services. That was the New Zealand Prime Minister Christopher Luxton speaking with our colleague Haslinda Armin. And the International Monetary Fund has inched up its expectations for global growth this year. It now sees output expanding 3.2% worldwide. The fund's latest World Economic Outlook report cites strength in the US and some emerging markets while warning the outlook remains cautious amid persistent inflation and geopolit geopolitical risks. Plus, it's urging China to find ways to offset headwinds from its property crisis. 
with an economy that is uh, that has potentially still relatively weak domestic demand, but is is uh, 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 is growing, then there will be an increased reliance on on the export sector, and that is something that, in the context of uh, very uh, tight uh, trade tensions, could be complicated. And so certainly that would be, uh, uh, you know, in the interest of uh, the Chinese economy to develop ways of uh, sustaining domestic uh, domestic demand. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has told German Chancellor Olaf Scholz that a surge in China's clean tech exports had helped cool inflation. His comments suggest that Beijing may not be swayed by European and U.S. pressure to bring in Chinese manufacturing capacity. Our Greater China editor Jenny Marsh is with us. And Jenny, you know, there is, of course, the, the, the school of thought that cheaper prices, particularly when it comes to uh, energy transition-related products, is only a good thing. And it sounds like Beijing is sort of in that camp. That was certainly the case that Xi Jinping made to Schultz yesterday in Beijing. Um, he really came out quite strongly defending China's industrial policy. You know, he presented um, the success they've had in manufacturing cheap goods in the green sector as a force for good in reducing climate um, threats and also sort of bringing down inflationary pressures, which has been a big challenge for policymakers in the EU and in the US, which are the two now biggest critics of its industrial policy. So this was really the first time we heard Xi Jinping sort of directly kind of responding to this barrage of criticism that his country has been facing in recent months. Jenny, of, of course, what else has come up in this visit has been Russia's war in Ukraine. Did we get any sense that Xi is going to be perhaps uh, putting any sort of pressure on, on Moscow here after this visit? I think, I think China's position on um, Russia's war in Ukraine has been consistent all along. You know, in terms of the peace conference that um, countries are trying to sort of rally China to engage with, uh, they've repeated again this week, you know, their position is they will engage with a conference where all parties are engaged, i.e. that means that Russia would have to be at the table as well. Um, but it is interesting if you look at some of the export data, um, China's um, exports from Russia dipped in March for the first time since mid-2022. And this sort of comes after... Um, a lot of pressure on China um, to not support um, Russia's war machine through its companies and supplying materials. Um, Yellen warned again during her trip earlier this week that if Chinese banks were seen to be um, supporting Russia's war machine in any way, uh, they could face sanctions. So while sort of diplomatically, I think, you know, Xi Jinping's stance hasn't changed and is unlikely to under pressure from the US at least, in the sort of the trade relationship, we are perhaps seeing some type of at least sort of moderation in, in how much China wants to be seen as propping up Russia's economy. That moderation is interesting, right, because we know that the, these engagements by, by Europe, by Germany, by the US comes at a time of vulnerability for China's economy. Is there a sense that there's more willingness to compromise from Beijing? I think there's, there's a heightened sense that China needs foreign investors right now. So both Yellen and Schultz have come with this very sort of coordinated message, it seems, that their companies don't feel fairly treated in China. And that's something I think the Chinese take very seriously because they're trying to get their economy back on its feet this year. They need foreign investors. They need companies from these big economies to want to invest in China. So I think, you know, while they're not going to probably adjust major policies, they're really trying to put forth this very accommodative sort of message that, you know, foreign companies are welcome here and they're more open. And so that means, you know, the CDF, this big sort of um, investment forum um, in China recently, you know, leaders were really kind of selling that message and Xi Jinping himself came out to meet CEOs. There's certainly more willingness in that sense to present a better message to the private sectors abroad. All right, that was our Greater China editor, Jenny Marsh, there. And uh, as we said, really that focus is, is very much on those economic differentials between what we see in China uh, versus the US. And, and that economic strength that we're getting from the US is also what's helping prompt uh, such dollar strength, such expectations around the, the Fed. Off the back of that, actually, it's been a huge slip in what we're seeing for currencies 
uh, across the board in emerging markets and, and, and really the dollar, uh, while well, we're hearing perhaps it's even bulldozing really its way through this, this uh, currency group, uh, really as well being aided by the moves that we see in the Chinese yuan, it is helping or adding to that selling pressure, even though China has moved to weaken it, its daily reference rate. But that's sort of the state of play there. Broadly, what we're seeing in currency markets this morning is uh, not too much change at this point in time. A little bit of strength coming back into the Kiwi, a, lot of, a little bit of strength back into the Aussie, but certainly concerns around dollar strength that we're hearing reflected from uh, different finance chiefs. Korea and Japan, for instance, they are concerned about the, their local currencies and that depreciation versus the greenback over the course of this year. But as we said, really, it is that story of, of King Dollar, best five-day run we've seen going back to 2022. Coming up, though, we're going to uh, shift the focus a little bit to AI because we're going to speak with the Deputy Director of Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Uh, its latest report shows that funding for generative AI saw an almost eight-fold increase last year. We'll have more insights next. This is Bloomberg. taking a look at what is our MLive Pulse survey of the week. It's looking at the upcoming earnings that we've got from the U.S. tech sector in particular. And what traders are really wanting to see is if the numbers can provide a fresh boost to markets. You've got the likes of Meta, Amazon, NVIDIA. They're just some of the names we're going to be hearing from over the coming days. Uh, AI investments, of course, another key focus, given we've seen that AI frenzy persisting into 2024. We want to know if Really, whether the investments that they've made, though, are starting to actually deliver higher profits. But let's stick with that AI theme and uh, bring in our next guest, Stanford University's Institute for Human-Centered AI. It's released a new report uh, focused on technological advancement, public perceptions, the geopolitical dynamics that are surrounding the development of AI as well. And the Institute's Deputy Director, Russell Ward, joins us now from San Francisco. So, uh, Russell, this is a a really significant report for, for the industry as a whole. But talk to us about what was perhaps your biggest takeaway from, from the numbers or, or the, the findings this time around. Well, naturally, every year you're going to get more and more of an increase, and we're seeing this hockey stick just slide up. Uh, and in that case, we're uh, seeing a lot of interesting things here. One, a couple of them that I find most interesting is that AI does beat humans in some tasks. And we're starting to see that gap get closed more and more. Uh, and one other key important thing that I think we're seeing is that uh, AI uh, is really being dominated by industry. The frontier models are coming from industry. And just one interesting anecdote that comes from this, in 2017, the transformer model that was created by Google that's really led to this explosion in the GPT aspects of uh, some of these models um, the, uh, and has helped create generative AI. That was $930 to train in 2017. And if you go to last year, uh, their latest mo model that just uh, came out, Gemini Ultra, was $194 million to train. So just in that short amount of time, you can see the difference of how much money it costs to really build these models. Yeah, it's, it's really wild numbers, actually, Russell. But when you have that sort of dynamic going on where you've got some clear leaders in the market and, and they have so much in terms of resources and so much to deploy into creating new models, how hard then does it make it for, for others to play any sort of catch up? And what does that mean then? It's not just hard, actually, for an industry to industry competition for them. It's also hard for other stakeholders. So I, of course, work at an academic institution, and this is where we see a large struggle for this. Not one uh, major university in the world could train a chat GPT model today if it wanted to, because it doesn't really have the resources possible to do that. Uh, so you're constraining not just uh, stakeholders within industry, you're constraining stakeholders within academia, and even to some extent government not having the resources to do this. That has a lot of implications. What does it mean for a limited select few companies that are doing this and who do we want setting the rules of the road and who's at the table? So we need to start really thinking about how robust this ecosystem is and how much we want to have it exclusively within one uh, area 
industry does great work, but it's not the only type of work that can be done here. I wanted to ask about uh, AI decoupling and sort of uh, the different pursuits by the likes of the US and China, right? For example, when it comes to regulation, you talk about this, you know, 50% plus increase in regulation that was seen just last year. Is that mostly in the US? And do we kind of face a reality eventually where there's going to be divergent regulatory environments uh, for similar AI technology? Yeah, the question is whether there's going to be interoperability with some of these uh, regulatory environments. But uh, in terms of who's leading the pack probably on this, it is the EU with the most robust regulations, and that's in the, from the EU AI Act. China actually does have some uh, strong regulations in place. There's a question in terms of enforcement. And the U.S. is frankly lagging in terms of regulations specific to AI. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not regulations in place that uh, in U.S. law that could easily be applied to AI. And that's really important to understand that distinction. And furthermore, there are a couple of ideas that are in Congress that are being talked about. Uh, and of course, there's the President, President Biden's uh, executive order on uh, artificial intelligence that has been quite uh, helpful and will guide companies. But it certainly is not uh, the same in terms of uh, regulation, and there's not parity between states on regulation, which will be a challenge. Where do you see, and I don't know if it's even possible to predict, the apex when it comes to investment enthusiasm for generative AI? That's really interesting because this year we had some kind of fascinating findings that came out from this. So overall, in terms of AI investment, it kind of has been down for the last two years, and to some extent, we, uh, from a global perspective. And we might say that's probably related to interest rates and where they're at. But if you look at in the US specifically, there was a 22% increase last year in private investment in AI, putting the US global share at about 67%. Now, if you're China, this was quite surprising, but there was a, a negative 44% uh, from uh, previous years, and that's giving them about an 8% total in private market share, which is, uh, frankly, was a surprising finding. And, and Russell, just quickly, what do you think is sort of the, the attitude toward AI? Because I think there's been a, a quite a high level of nervousness from a lot of people that their job, for instance, would be replaced. Is that sort of subsiding or is there sort of more of an awareness of the, of the shape or role that AI will take in people's lives? There's an awareness, but it also it depends on where you're geographically located so uh, and what your attitudes are. Uh, those are not across the board uh, views. And actually, people in uh, a very Western industrialized states have a more pessimistic view towards AI than those that are not. And, you know, there's some hypotheses. This report itself is a very heavily data focused report and doesn't necessarily give inference and or uh, an, a strong analysis. Uh, to that end, I think one reason might be uh, there's more of a fear factor uh, within uh, industrialized countries that some of these jobs can easily be more easily replaced than they might have expected at the industrial level. Russell, really great to have you with us uh, in what is a fascinating report. Russell Wald is a deputy director at Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. More ahead here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Are getting uh, Japan trade data coming through for the month of March. The trade balance coming at 366.5 billion yen. There, uh, a little bit higher and wider than expectations of 345 and a half billion yen. Uh, imports are contracting 4.9 percent. The estimate was a contraction of 5.1 percent. We're seeing exports rising 7.3 percent. That uh, beat expectations of a gain of 7 percent. We did expect the brisk growth when it comes to exports. That would have been supported by pretty good demand for Japanese. 
Japanese autos in uh, the US and EU and also a positive turnaround for the semiconductor cycle as well. We've seen boosted demand for uh, semi-related items. We did see in the early data from March showing that rise in export numbers uh, and the decline in import numbers as well. And very interesting to watch out for the impact of the yen, which is really, of course, seen to be benefiting a lot of those trade and export uh, oriented names. Uh, that yen just sustaining weakness to close to 155 and a lot of traders saying uh, 160 is now the threshold to be looking for. Yeah, it certainly seems to be the next level in play. But let's stick with Tokyo or Japan because stocks there have surged so much since last year that expectations or expectations from investors for corporate earnings could be getting a little bit out of hand. Some companies have seen stock sell-offs in the past week despite recent quarterly results or decent. But uh, let's bring in our senior Asia stock reporter Hideyuki Sano joining us from Tokyo. And Hideyuki, it's a really interesting dynamic, better than expected numbers, but still there's this risk that investors are going to get disappointed. Hi there, exactly. Um, it's probably not surprising to see that kind of a reaction, though. I mean, if you look back what happened during the first quarter, the Japanese stock market has risen almost like 20 percent. And what, at the same time, the analyst expectations of earnings have basically risen just like 3 percent. So basically, it has been driven by multiple ex expansion. And I think there's also a bit of a euphoria. Uh, after the Nikkei rose above its 1989 peak. I mean, it's quite unusual to see the market um, rising uh, for the first time, rising above a th uh, to hit a 33-year high. Um, so, yes, there, there's higher risk at the moment of uh, disappointment at upcoming earnings seasons. Hede, how would you rate earnings season so far? Yeah, um, so we have uh, earnings mainly from retail companies and um, market reaction has been quite harsh. Um, um, even when companies are reporting decent reports, so they didn't really have any sort of po big positive surprises. But I mean, on the whole, companies like uh, Seven and I seems to be doing OK, but um, market reaction was quite uh, quite tough um, and for instance seven and nine fell more than five percent I think and also department store I mean they, their sales has been doing great because of inbound tourism and also some signs of uh, recovery in high-end consumption but their shares have tanked in the recent uh, few days and that also seems to reflect that the um, investors are having a quite elevated expectations. And one thing to note is that the retail sector is not particularly the best sector in the past few months. I mean, they have underperformed topics. So if this is an example of what to expect, then probably you, it's not hard to imagine that the risk for the other sectors could be even higher. Senior Asia stock reporter Hideo Kusano there. Uh, take a look at how we're setting up when it comes to global bond markets and of course really following the moves that we saw in US Treasuries in particular. Uh, taking a look at the moves that we saw across the two year, the yield climbing past 5%. That's the highest level since November but broadly really across the spectrum US yields are sitting at those 2024 highs uh, even as we continue to see kind of short moves being uh, dominant in this market but all of this after Fed Chair Powell signalling that policymakers will wait longer than previously expected to cut rates. We'll get you to the market opens next. This is Bloomberg.